Hi, welcome to the 28th rule of acquisition. This is the investment trap. Don't be held hostage by investment. It could turn into a life sentence. And I'll explain what investment means in a moment. Don't get involved in anything you can't walk away from in 30 seconds. That's a line from the movie Heat. And 28B, the truth owes you nothing. Humans are very emotional creatures. When humans make an emotional investment in something, they will obsessively hold on to it beyond all reason. And I've got some examples that will follow. But let's, before we explore human examples, let's look at an example from the animal kingdom. The retarded monkey trap. There's an interesting way that uh, bush people capture monkeys to find out where sources of water are. What they do is they drill a hole into an anthill and put a piece of salt, rock salt in there. And the monkey goes in and grabs the rock salt, but then he can't get his hand out of the hole because he's making a fist. And that's how the bush person is able to catch the monkey, because the monkey just can't let go. Now, I don't know if this is a real thing or this was just a, uh, a spoof, but it kind of highlights what we're talking about here. Let me give you an example with gamblers. Gamblers... You know, especially like slot machine people will say, oh, the machine's about to pay off. You know, it's, I put so many dollars in, it's going to pay off eventually. And yeah, sure, by the law of large numbers, it's going to pay off at a certain rate. And then if you've been sitting there putting money into a machine, eventually you're going to get a payoff. The problem are you're going to get more money back than you put in. Well, a lot of people just want to obsess because they put a lot of time and effort and money, and it doesn't really matter what game they're playing. And they just they think they're going to at least get something back for their effort, and they end up end up losing money uh, obsessing over it, whatever. It becomes an obsession. New inventors. I know a lot of people that got patents. This is their first patent. They spent a lot of time, effort. It was a, you know, it was a lot of emotional investment, a lot of financial investment, a lot of learning. A lot of these inventions are unique and novel, but it doesn't mean they're profitable or that they have an advantage over what we already have. And so they hold on to these inventions to the point of trying to sell them to the point where their family's going, oh, come on, enough is enough. You can't sell this thing. Is more often than not, a, a new idea, a new patent is not saleable. Or the person that comes up with the invention is not in the position to capitalize on the invention. Uh, but these people hold on because this is you know, what defines them. This becomes the definition of their life. Oh, I'm an inventor. I've got a patent. I'm smart. How many of my friends have done that? And so it becomes, again, an obsession that people will hold on to beyond all reason. And physicists, okay, if you're a physicist, you struggle to make it through college, you struggle to get a job, um, then you struggle to get a job where you can do original thesis work, because that's one of the main reasons that people go into physics is to do original research. Okay, then you struggle to get funding for your prep project, you struggle to get your research accepted by your peers. And then one day a crazy inventor makes you obsolete overnight, let's say, for example, the Wright brothers. And, for example, Langley was a Ph.D. working on heavier-than-air flight. And the Bright brothers just came along and basically ate his lunch. And he did not allow. He was also the curator of the Smithsonian Institute. And until his death in 1945, he would not allow the Wright brothers' creation into the Smithsonian Institute. Okay, you will never not give up on your investment overnight. You will hold on beyond all reason. And let me give you the treasure hunt analogy to what I just explained uh, for like a career. This could be a career in anything, but I'm going to focus on a career in physics. Uh, and we're going to use the map for kind of the, your education, climbing the rock to get to the secret cave that hides the treasure. That's kind of climbing up the corporate or the, the academic ladder, as it were. And, you know, first you've got to choose what your career is going to be, which treasure chain you're going to be, an engineer, a physicist, a lawyer, or a doctor, or whatever. So that's basically the metaphor of choosing your career, is choosing which map to follow. And this, remember, when you're a young person, you're going to put a lot of effort in deciding what you're going to do for the rest of your life. So there's a lot of emotion involved. There's a lot of investment. There's a lot of hemming and hawing. There's a lot invested already at this point. Then the planning stage, like you're planning for an expedition. So you're going to plan how much to take, how much you're going to take with you, what course you're going to take to get to the X on the map, yada, yada, yada. Getting money for investing, investment for, for um, food, for water, for transportation, 
you know, for things you're going to need on the trip. That's the metaphor of getting your education in physics. Again, and then you're going to go on this long journey, and it's going to be a long road. It's four years or five years or six years or eight years, depending on how deep you go, how long a journey you want, whether you want to do a PhD or a bachelor's, yada, yada, yada. Then when you finally get into academia, then you have to climb the, the, the ladder of academia. You've got to start off being a lab assistant or whatever, however physicists start, I don't know. Until you get to the point where you can eventually get to the point where you can do your own original work, your own original research where you can get your grant money and you can get the notoriety and you can even get your own Discovery Channel show. So, but then what happens is halfway up the climb, some inventor, like the Wright brothers, come along and basically make your entire work, the entire thing you've invested everything in, worthless overnight. So what do you do? You're going to sit here halfway up your, your climb, or even almost all the way up. You've spent all this time and effort, and you just can't just let it go. And so what are the, the financiers going to say? What are the people that are backing your research going to say? Well, you just can't, you know, walk away from them. You're not going to get any more money. People are going to like, well, you're going to... You know, what are your depends? Your family depends on this income. You just can't stop your career overnight and say, you know, it's going to be difficult to switch into another branch of physics that isn't already, you know, you're going to start over, essentially. A lot of people are going to just continue the climb. So you have two choices. You can admit defeat. Your backers will certainly withdraw funding. It'll be difficult to get new funding because, obviously, you've got to start over with a new idea, a new career path, a new venue of research. And it's going to be hard times until you find a new path. But at least your credibility and your honor are intact. Okay? The other thing, what a lot of people do, they just continue on. They say, oh, no, those Wright brothers, they don't know what they're talking about. You know, uh, and then, then what they're going to do is continue to take other people's money fraudulently. Because, hey, you know, they like the lifestyle of having that money, that income, that prestige. But what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to keep this lie going until the day you die, just like Langley did. Otherwise, if you ever come out later and say, oh, well, yeah, the Wright brothers are right, your backers are going to say, wait a minute, you've been taking my money since the Wright brothers. When did you know this was a, when did you know that you were taking our money for no good reason? And they're going to sue you. And you start losing credibility. So you're going to have to take this lie with you till the day you die and hold on to the lie so that people think that at least you're honest in your beliefs and not fraudulent. And so this can become a life sentence. It's better to just walk away and have your credibility intact than to just have to keep up a lie for the rest of your life. So the investment trap. Don't be held hostage by investment. It could turn into a life sentence. And this applies to everything. Not just physics or whatever, whatever. It applies to everything in life. And this comes up the rule of acquisition 28A which says, don't involve in anything that you can't walk away from in 30 seconds. And this is from the movie Heat, and these are the words of Robert De Niro in the movie Heat. And basically, that's good advice for what they do in this movie. If a heist starts to go bad, you just walk away. Or if this is your new heist, if you've never been, if you're new at doing heists, a new person would probably try to save all the work and effort they put into this initial heist, just like the new inventor does, or just like the physicist does. But a person that does this all the time is going to say, hey, you know, there's other fish, there's other uh, things to heist, there's other venues of scientific, there's other inventions to be made, there's other things to do. Okay, so an experienced person knows just to walk away. It's, it's less effort to start anew on a, something else, whereas a person that's never done this before, they already have a lot of emotional investment and they want to try to save it. But in terms of a heist, when your heist goes bad, obviously, it's better just to walk away and not try to save it. And that's what the advice here for if you're going to be a heist. But again, this applies to everything in life. Okay, if your stuff is going bad, if, if your research has been overtaken by the Wright brothers, you're probably better off just walking away clean instead of trying to save it. It's going to be a lot more trouble to try to save it than it is to start anew. Or even t step on the shoulders of the Wright brothers and do something more with that. And in 28A, in action, I walked away from the high voltage generator. The reasons for walking away from the high voltage generator because I did not need it anymore. Uh, you're going to learn more about that in the Breaking Relativity premiere where we're going to explain where we have to go with the experiments. Okay, And I was also able to figure out why the over-the-counter or off-the-shelf generator was, was wrong with it. I was able to use that. And in the upcoming 
uh, behind the scenes number nine, I'm going to show you the results with that generator. To, uh, one day I'll, I'll come back and continue the generator for fun, but right now it has no bearing on moving ethereal mechanics forward, and that's explained in the breaking relativity premiere. And rule of acquisition 28b, the truth owes you nothing. Just because you put a lot of investment in something, you put a lot of time, effort, and money, and tears, and blood, sweat, and all that other stuff, does not mean the truth owes you a damn bit. So don't expect it. Okay, we should not become emotionally invested in our present scientific theories because then it will be difficult to let them go when they are proven wrong. And they will all be eventually proven wrong. And we must assume they will always be proven wrong. And we should only ever treat scientific theories as a gateway for their own obsolescence. This is going to be explained in the premiere of the Distinti Paradigm series called the Gateway Feedback Paradigm. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your patience. And for those giving donations, thank you for those as well.